Yeah, because print forces you to apply critical thought because you have to pay for it. So if you're going to make a print at home on your inkjet and you're looking at images and you shot a motorized sequence and you've got six frames in a series and you go, man, I, I guess I have to print all six of these. Well, you're going to look at inkjet costs, the ink and the paper, the consumables and be like, man, I don't want to print all six. So you have to choose. Um, I did a, a, a YouTube film yesterday that I released yesterday called Notes on Photography, and I showed two images shot sequentially of the same scene, but they're very different. And I sort of said, this is the one that I would have chosen and here's why, but this is really close. Like I can argue for both of these images, but if I'm going to make a book or a publication, for the most part, I've got to choose. I have to make a final decision as to which one of these sums up the story best because I don't need both of them. Right. Printing, printing both of them sort of shows in some ways a um, lack of editing skill, but also a redundancy that may or may not add to the actual narrative of the book. And so, again, it's, you know, good photo editors, when you see them in action, there are people who just do nothing but edit photographs all day long. They are simply at a level that is hard to comprehend in terms of how they're looking at, at photographs. I've I've had it happen to me where people um, have edited my work in a way that I just never saw. I never put it together the way that they saw because I was too close to the photographs. I'm too close to the stories. Yeah. And I put it in front of a professional editor who doesn't have that attachment is just looking at content. And man, do they they take they, they can basically blow your mind with um, how they see your work. Yeah. Um, there is a subcategory of edit that I should probably touch on which is when you go, and this, this could be its own separate point. When you go to make a book, it's very helpful to define what it is you are trying to make. Are you making a portfolio or are you making a book? Are you making a magazine? All those things will have an impact on the digital asset management. They will have an impact on the edit, the materials, all those kind of things. Because a narrative, a book has a story to it. And you may have to include images that are not beautiful, but they help tell the story. Whereas a portfolio might just be a 10 images total and they don't tell a story. It's just a sample of your best photographic work. Those are two publications with, with very different purposes. And because of those purposes, the edit will change. You know, what you don't want in a portfolio is any extraneous images because then the person looking at it is going to say, you don't know how to edit because you put a, you put two of the same image in, or you, you have images that are too similar. And they're going to say, oh, you probably don't know how to edit very well. Now, with a book, with a narrative, you may have to put in a bunch of images that aren't portfolio level, but they're educational. And they take the viewer on that narrative that you need them to go on. So right. defining what it is you want to make is really key. Um, the last uh, point number four is I think Irma Boom was the one who said this, which is the cover is designed last but it's what makes the first impression. And so I think doing your cover last is a good idea. I think you can mock one up. If you have an idea for what the cover is going to be up front, go ahead and mock it up. Don't spend too much time on it. Mock it up and then leave it and do the rest of the book and then come back and revisit. Yeah. I think oftentimes that first attempt at the cover is sometimes a bit on the obvious side and it, and it can stand to use a little refinement that comes over time. And when you've got the rest of the inside pages designed and you're ready, then go back and, and revisit that cover. And undoubtedly, and in my, with my books, the cover evolves at the, at the last, at the end, absolutely. There's no question. You're not going to spend a lot of time designing the cover and then writing the book or putting the book together. So you're absolutely right. But it is good to have some starting point just as a placeholder sure. and nothing else. Yeah. Good point. And the last point, and there's no way around this, um, whether you're going to make a print or you're going to make a book or you're going to make a magazine, you have to be prepared to test. You have to make test prints. Mm -hmm. You have to make test books. You, you don't have to make the giant 100 page hardcover test book, but you better make a 20 page soft cover test book 
Because if you think you're going to make one and think it's going to be perfect the first time out, you're probably going to be wildly disappointed because I don't know many people who can pull that off. The same with printing. And here's the funny part is when inkjet printing really arrived, which was mid 90s. That's when everybody started to buy desktop inkjet printers. The Epson EX, I think, was the first one that really, you know, and, and at that time, those printers, they weren't archival. The, the magenta ink would shift almost immediately. There were problems, but they were also awesome. We all knew how fun and great this was to have an inkjet printer. And so I had, over the, the course of that following 10 years, I had photographer friends who were very famous who ended up getting sponsored by everyone and everything. Their camera was sponsored, their printer, their inks, their profilers, um, their paper, everything was provided free of charge. And one of these guys was very, um, he was just a gem of a guy who was in incredibly generous. And anytime I got into a bind where I needed a print, I would go to his house and he would make prints for me, regardless of how big. If I needed 20 by 30s, he would print them without even batting an eye. But one of the things I noticed was he had every piece of equipment you could possibly have. He had the best color management system. He had the best calibration system. He had the best printers, the best ink, the best computers, the best everything. And we never nailed a print on the first try. Never. Even if it was like technically perfect, we always looked at it and said, we need to change some things. So on a, on a typical inkjet print, we might, we might make three or four test prints before we got to the print that we nailed. And the same exact thing applies to bookmaking or magazine making. Most of the time I make multiple test books before I get to the book that I actually want. And that's just par for the course. Every single good bookmaker I know does that. No one nails it on the first try. Um, and publishers often don't. That's why people go on press and they, you know, look at what's coming out of the presses and then they start making, you know, they do a proof print. Totally. A proof book. And then they tweak the presses. The yeah. artist comes in and says, oh, it's, a bit, it's too, too magenta, you know, add, add whatever. Add cyan, you know, I need to balance this out. And, we, and you refine and you test. So making a test book, not only should that not be stressful, or, or viewed as a pain, that should be one of the best parts of the process because it eliminates all the stress of making anything. Because the only person who's gonna see the test book is you. And you're just making one copy or the test print. You know, you, you're gonna look at it and go, okay, I need to change this. I'm gonna add magenta, you know, maybe it's not neutral, whatever. And then you tear up that test print or stick it in your journal like I would and write down the notes of what you did in it. Yeah. Um, and then move on and make something else. Please subscribe and enable the bell so you don't miss any of our new shows. Like the video and please share it and leave your comments. I love hearing from you. And remember to get out and capture your own images of life.